ready to come and worship the Lord. We're glad that you're with us today. Uh, just want to bring a few announcements uh, to remind you of the things that are going on in the days ahead. Um, you'll notice last Sunday we had the blue Christmas tree here at the front, and you had the opportunity to come and uh, put some names and remembrance and memories on that. We moved it now out to the foyer. Uh, you're still able to, if you want to, go by and, and take a tag and write uh, a loved one that has gone before, a uh, name on there, maybe a memory of your name. Uh, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory on the tag. You just put it on the tree. And so I found it good this morning to go around and just read them. I just take it some time to look at those and remember those. Remember the people uh, who have gone on before. And so uh, feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, point setters are listed here on the, on the platform. If you'd like to donate one in, in honor or memory of someone, uh, the, the cost is $10. And you can just mark it on an offering note and make sure that the name is listed on there and we'll make sure it gets listed then up in the PowerPoints. We'll have a list of that printed in our Christmas Eve bulletin uh, as well as uh, throughout the rest of this Advent season. You may have noticed the Christmas uh, card mailbox in the foyer. Uh, there are some cards already making their way in there so you want to take a chance after church to take a look to see if you might have a card someone has brought you there. You can feel free to bring them to church, put them in the box and then the people you've uh, given them to will pick those up. So take advantage of that as well. Christmas celebration. Our Christmas Eve candlelight service will be at 6.30 on Christmas Eve. I hear at the church. Invite your friends and family to come and, and join us for that time of candlelight uh, worship and fellowship. And then also uh, Christmas morning worship. That will be at 10.30 instead of a regular 10 o'clock. So you want to uh, take note of that so that you can... Uh, be here at 10.30. I realize Christmas morning has a lot of stuff going on. And so we tried to set it kind of in the middle. So maybe if you have things going on in the morning, you can come to church after. Or if you've got something going on at dinner or the afternoon, you can come before. We just invite you to come. It's going to be fairly simple. Singing carols, read the Christmas story. And just remember why we celebrate this season. To remember Jesus and his coming. So that's what we want to do then on Christmas, on Christmas Day. So other announcements are listed there in your bulletin. You can be aware of those as we go forward. Uh, take note of those as we walk through this season. We've been walking through this season of Advent, and so uh, we're going to continue as we have in reading together uh, the purpose this third Sunday of Advent. So you'll notice on the screen you'll see the words that the reader will do, and then when the bold ones come up in the blue, uh, that will be for you. So let's prepare our hearts to worship. We're reminded of the angels bringing good news of great joy to the shepherds this season. Yet many are in a season of suffering, wondering how to have joy. Our joy comes from the Lord. We wait, we patiently wait for Christ to return and make all things right. Yet even in the waiting, we have work to do. Like a farmer who plants the seeds and works the fields, we plant and work in the hope that our joy will be made complete. Our joy comes from home. We are called to stand firm even in the face of challenges. We're called to care for our sisters and brothers. The community of faith reminds us that we are not alone. Our joy comes from community. We're called once again to live in the already not yet kingdom of God and to trust that Christ will return to make all things right. While we wait, we partner with the Holy Spirit in kingdom work now. Our joy comes from our hope in the Lord and from seeing his kingdom come. We light the candle of joy today, not to ignore suffering, but to acknowledge that we are not forgotten even as we lament, grieve, or mourn. The good news is, is that Christ came. Christ is with us. And Christ will come again. We have joy in knowing that. In a world that still awaits the return of Christ, we make all things right. We still have joy because we know that Christ has come and Christ will come again. God of joy, in the midst of whatever we're going through, give us a reminder that you are with us. Help us find joy in the glimpses of your kingdom at work in our world even now, and the perseverance to hope for your return, when our joy will be made complete. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you give us joy even in suffering. You give us joy even in difficulty. 
For the joy that we have does not come from our circumstance, but it comes from you. Fill our hearts with joy, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we prepare to worship. is disentangling herself from a baby. <laughs> Let's sing together.
going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning. I want to continue to pray for those who uh, are in need. Continue to lift up their several names listed here. I want to add to that this morning. Uh, my brother Milford and his wife, Denise, they, ride, they drive truck across the country. They go coast to coast. Uh, they were in a, an auto accident, a truck accident, uh, this past yesterday or the day before? I think it was the day before yesterday. Uh, in Ohio, which is not where they live, uh, their truck was really messed up. Fortunately, uh, God was gracious and they were not injured. Uh, but they've got to go try to figure out how to replace the truck. The truck that hit them, another semi, uh, took off uh, down the road. So it's going to be an interesting time. So if you're praying for Milford and Deneen, I know that they'd appreciate your prayers this morning. Continue to lift up Catherine. Uh, she continues to walk this road uh, to the Lord. Um, Lord will come at some point and bring Catherine home, but at this point she's still uh, at home being cared for by hospice, so continue to lift uh, that family up in prayer as well. Uh, you'll see several others that are listed here that we've been continuing to pray for, so we want to lift them up in prayer today. Uh, I know there are a number of circumstances across our country and around the world as well that we're praying for that God would uh, indeed encourage and lift. We live in a world that is has sin and curse. We've got to remember that. Sometimes I think, well, you know, Jesus is coming. We celebrate his coming, but there's still difficulty in the world. And so we want to remember to focus on Jesus even in the midst of these difficult times. We're going to go to prayer this morning, and as we do, uh, these altars are open an opportunity for you to come and kneel, uh, bring whatever need or burden you have before the Lord this morning. And as we do, we'll go to the Lord.
Lord Jesus, we thank you today for every good and perfect gift that you give us. And I thank you today for all those who have given that, Lord, your kingdom might move forward, that people might hear the gospel, and that others might receive your help and mercy in this world. Lord, for this we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong, do not fear. Your God will come, he will come with vengeance. With divine retribution, he will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling spring. New Testament reading is Luke 1, 46 through 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has fulfilled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our father. Another opportunity to pray for patience. People often say this because.
because we are not a patient people. We like two-day shipping from Amazon. We like high-speed internet. We like to be able to go to the restaurant and get our food very quickly through fast food. We simply don't like to wait. Uh, if you're not aware of that, just drive somewhere around 5 o'clock on Townsend, and you'll see all those people that really don't like to wait. And when we're confronted with a passage about patience, we might want to jump right past it to go on to something else because it, it gets into our lives. It begins to, to speak to us about our heart. We don't like to talk about being patient and suffering, about not grumbling about others, about being discontent in the circumstances that we have. So I want to I want to get a show of hands this morning. How many of you have grumbled waiting in line for something you thought was taking too long? Okay, I thought so. We'd have a full crowd today. This sermon may be a little bit convicting as we preach on the Sunday of joy. That's why we have the pink candle to remind us of the joy that comes to our lives. And yet, joy often seems to slip away because of the circumstances that surround us. So the question I want to ask this morning is this. Can we have joy during seasons of patient waiting? I actually adjusted the wording here just a little bit as I was getting ready to preach. Initially, I put down, can we have joy in the midst of seasons of patient suffering? You see, sometimes I think the waiting and the suffering go hand in hand because all of us struggle with difficult moments in our lives when it doesn't come as fast as we think it ought to, when we don't just bounce back from that illness or we, we, we don't see that job moving as quickly or whatever it might be in your circumstances, we struggle in the midst of suffering. Yet, think for a second about the early church. The early church who suffered persecution and famine who were put to death simply because they believed in the name of Jesus. And yet they did so in a sense of joy and a sense of purpose that disregarded, if you will, their circumstances. Is there space for joy even when we are persecuted? Even when we suffer? So today let's turn to the book of James. Chapter 5, verses 7 to 10. We're going to read through this. And I want to bring up some thoughts today as we talk about finding joy in our patient suffering. Be patient, then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and the spring rains? You, too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord faithfully or finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Lord, we pray today as we enter this word that you would help us to find the joy that resides in your presence in the midst of the circumstances which may seem unbearable. Lord, open our hearts to your joy, we pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at this. Let's talk about patience. Let's talk about waiting this morning. First of all, patience is more than endurance. It is forbearance. The scripture says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. Sometimes we think of patience as passively waiting for something to happen. We're, we're sitting back in our chair waiting for something to take place. But James teaches us that these words is actively living out our faith while we wait for the Lord's return. There is work to be done even while we wait. You see, waiting isn't a bad word when we choose to continue to go on. Sometimes maybe we're waiting for that next job, but we need to keep doing the previous job. So 
Sometimes we are, are waiting for that extra strength that we have, but we just need to get up and slog forward during the day. Every once in a while, I'll have one of those, what I call them, trudging days. <laughs> and trudging days, some of you understand exactly what I mean. That means you really didn't want to get out of bed, but you did. And you got out of bed, and you took a shower, and you put your clothes on, and you said, okay, I don't know how much I can get done, but I want to start. And then you just kind of work through the day. And some things come easily. Some things, oh, yeah, I should have just, why did I put that off? It should have just happened. Other things are hard. And they were as hard as I thought they were going to be. And maybe even a little harder. But I continued to trudge forward. You see, James here is talking about, as Christians, when we're waiting for the return of the Lord, you see, Jesus had come, and now they were anticipating his second coming, just like we are. Waiting for Jesus to come back. Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. We're ready. But until that day, there's work to be done. So James focuses on faith in action while we wait. In James um, 2.26, it says, faith without deeds is dead. In other words, if we're not doing something, we're just sitting back uh, in our easy chair hoping that Jesus will come tonight so I don't have to face my problems tomorrow. That really is a faith. Faith is continuous on even when we don't feel like it. I like how James uses this analogy of a farmer to illustrate what it means to patiently wait for the Lord's return. In James 5.7 it says, See how the farmer waits for the land to yield his valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. I grew up on a farm. That was kind of my, my growing up years. And, and, and sometimes there would be seasons when we're very, very busy. Harvest is a very busy time when you've got to get the crop in before the storm comes. Or if you're trying to get hay out of the field before the rain comes. I mean, there's days we work late into the night to make sure those kind of things happen. On the other hand, there's other times when you're simply preparing the soil. And, and you feel like you're just driving the tractor around because I'm making a circle in the field. What am I doing? You know, I remember some days I remember looking at my dad and go, why are we doing this? You know, I mean, all we're doing is driving around the field. You know, they're turning over the dirt in the back, but I don't know what's going on. But he's preparing a seed bed, getting ready to put nitrogen and fertilizer down, getting ready to get the soil so that the roots can go down deep and ground the plant. There is work to be done even when it seems like there's nothing to do. Then we watch the seeds. If you've ever planted a garden, you know that you gotta you got to kind of watch the plants. Um, I don't like this, but it's part of what it is when trying to grow plants. I remember when I was a kid, we would we would plant our garden. My dad had a garden about the size of this sanctuary. And I'm like, of course he had three boys and we were intended to take care of it. Um, but not all seeds are the same. Some seeds, you throw them into a line and you scatter them out and then you got to thin them out so they don't uh, get on top of each other. I remember you used to plant cucumbers and watermelon. And you'd build this mound up, and you put the seeds there in it so you could water around the edge of it. And then others, you just like the lettuce, you just put it in a line, it would grow, and you'd cut it, and it was just there. But you had to pay attention. Farmers were patient to till the soil, to plant the seeds, to nurture the seeds, and then would come the busy time of harvest. James says here that they waited for the rain to come, and that season of the Middle East. You needed the fall and the spring rains to be able to bring the fruit to life. But it's waiting. We understand that over here, the peach farmers that want to get past the frost, and they're out there in the middle of the night, and they turn on their wind to move and circulate the air to protect the little flowers, the little buds, so that in the fall we can have peaches and enjoy them. That's where we're at as believers. We're in the in-between. We're in the waiting. We're faithfully doing the task. Maybe we're witnessing to our neighbor. Or maybe we're just simply living our faith out on the job so that someone else can see that Jesus is real. We attended the Montrose County Christmas party last night. I get to go because I'm married to Kim. Um, they let me in there. But what was interesting was, as I was there, there were different people that I had connected with throughout town. And they would come by the table and say hi. They would, they would talk and visit. And I'm like, you know, you're patiently waiting. You're sowing seed. You're, you're investing in the lives for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And that's what we're called to do. We are called to forbear, to, to bear with, if you will, the things that are going on in order that we might look forward to the hope of the coming of Jesus. We are called to be patient, to stand firm as the Lord's coming draws near. The scripture says you should be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. In some ways, this theme builds upon the first week of hope. We are actively engaged in the work of the kingdom, even as the kingdom has not yet reached its fulfillment. This is an active statement, an exhortation to dig in our heels and prepare for the long, hard wait. How many of you prayed for revival? You can raise your hand if you want to. And we continue to pray for revival. We continue to pray for God's kingdom to come, for people to be saved, for the world to be transformed. We gather monthly as a as a people in the body of Christ. And yet we look at a culture that doesn't fit Jesus. And we see all the darkness that is around us. And the temptation we have in the midst of this is to go back into our little corner and play safe. To go back in somewhere where we know the people that are around us, that we can be comfortable there and, and, and say, Jesus, please come. You know, I mean, I've been there sometimes as a kid. You're like, I just want through here. We went to Haiti uh, early in my ministry with a group of people to build a church. We went to Haiti. We enjoyed that ministry. And we got there. And, and I tell you what, you want to find a vibrant Christian community. Haiti has a vibrant Christian community. The voodoo drums would pound at night, but the prayers of the saints were heard in the morning as they prayed against the darkness that surrounded them. But we got our job done. We went back on the truck and we came over the mountains, headed back to Port au Prince uh, so I could hop on a plane and go back to America and not deal with the stuff that they dealt with there. Yeah, that's kind of the way it, it felt. And then we blew a tire in Port au Prince at night in the middle of nowhere. And we got to get the tire fixed. And it's dark. And one thing I noticed there was that since they were all people of color. I could only see their eyes in the darkness. And I remember coming down and trying to figure our way out through Port au Prince, and I was just kneeling down in the back of the truck, looking out the front window because we were in kind of a troop thing in the back. And I just remember, Jesus, get us home. That's really what I was praying. Jesus, get me out of this. Now, that's not a really great ministerial attitude, I'll confess. You know, I'm not thinking, well, maybe we need to stop here. Maybe there's somebody going to come by and we can pray with them. Maybe they can become a Christian. You know, that wasn't my thought. I'm like, just get me out of this darkness. Get me into the safety of the compound. That's what I want. Jesus calls us to stand firm even when the world is messed up. Stand firm in our faith in Jesus. Stand firm in what his word teaches. Stand firm in the willingness to go forth and, and talk to people and share the gospel with Jesus. Stand firm in the midst of it. There's many a battles won when a few people just simply stood firm and said, no, we're not backing up anymore. We're going to hold this place until help comes. God has called us to occupy this world, to be present in the world as a witness to Jesus, as an ambassador, till he comes. No man knows the day nor hour. We're not going to be able to put it on a time schedule. But we need to stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Amen? Amen. Jesus is coming back. And there will be a day when the kingdom becomes actualized, just not in between. When we can live in the light of Jesus. And so God calls us to stand firm. But here's a temptation that happens in the middle of it. While we are standing firm, don't grumble about other people. James says, don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you'll be judged, for the judge stands at the door. Apparently, that was a specific problem that was being dealt with by the people that James was writing to. That while they were waiting, while they were patiently looking forward to Jesus, while they were enduring the suffering they were enduring, they were looking around to other people and saying, man, what's wrong with them? And they were grumbling. I remember the people of Israel, it cost them 40 years to grumble. They came to the promised land, they didn't want to enter in, and then they wandered into the desert, and whenever the Lord seemed to get upset, it was because the people were grumbling. They had a problem, they had something else. Don't let the difficulty of your situation 
as you patiently endure your way towards Christ, sour your attitude to those that are around you. You see, there are some that are going through worse things than you are. They're walking through a road that you don't have to walk through, and they're, they're enduring what you don't have to endure, and they need your grace and your mercy, and sometimes uh, we get a grumpy day because we just don't feel good. Um, I learned that over Thanksgiving when I was stuck in my room. Now, they didn't lock the key and throw it out. <laughs> they did bring me food. But there were days when I just felt grumpy. Now, I know why I felt grumpy. I was stuck in my room, and I had COVID. But here was my temptation. I was tempted to explain away my grumpiness because of my circumstances. That it was okay to not be what Jesus wanted me to be because, well, Jesus knows what's going on. He'll let me be grumpy today. Now, I'm not saying I'm never grumpy. If, if I say that, you can go talk to Kim and find us otherwise. <coughs> but what I'm trying to say is don't let your circumstances sour you on somebody else. Even if they don't believe right, even if they aren't living right, don't let your attitude touch because if your attitude sours towards somebody else, you can't minister to them. If your heart goes negative towards them, you have a hard time reaching out to them. We need to allow Jesus to be the judge. You see, it says here, don't judge each other or you'll be judged. But the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. So if we're real critical of other people, then that measure is going to turn right back towards us. <coughs> Jesus is standing at the door. When he comes back, he will judge. When he comes back, he will judge the entire earth as he sits on the throne. So he doesn't allow us that place. That doesn't mean we need to just agree with everything. I'm not saying that. God calls us to be discerning in the world around us. But we leave other people to Jesus and we stand before him ourselves. We take the back out of our eye before we go doing major surgery in someone else's. Our time spent waiting, there's too much work to do, too much kingdom work to be doing, to spend our time grumbling and looking at other people. No one is excited about the circumstances they're in, but the community of faith needs to be a place where we're united to strengthen one another, to pray for one another, to lift one another up instead of grumbling and complaining about each other. During suffering, we have a choice. We can unite and care for one another and strengthen each other and wait expectantly for Jesus, or we can judge one another with a complaining attitude. Now, now i got to say this morning, you're not really grumblers. You're good people. I, I, I am thankful for that. I, I've been amongst grumblers, and I don't like being amongst grumblers. You're not that. But the temptation still sits there. It sits there for me. It sits there for all of us. Satan would love to pull us off to the grumbling side rather than put us focused on kingdom work looking for the return of Jesus. In the culture, are we a grumbling Christian culture or are we a culture focused on Jesus, looking forward to him and giving our lives to serve a world that he died for? Brings me to my third point. And that is the prophets are our example of patience in the midst of suffering. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Now, the early church would be very familiar with these prophets. Job, for example, is a primary, you know, when we talk about suffering, we talk about the patience of Job. Uh, we talk about all that's going on in his life. His friends and his wife encouraged him to turn away from God to, to reject God and just curse God and die. And yet Job didn't. He stayed focused on the Lord. Now Job's faith didn't mean his suffering disappeared. That's an important thing to remember. Sometimes we may have faith in God and we're trusting God, but our suffering is still there. Job's story is ultimately a story of the compassion and mercy of God who walked him through this suffering, showing Satan that there was somebody that would follow God even when he was trying to attack him. And in the end, God restored Job's life. Think of Daniel going into the lion's den. Elijah was pursued by Queen Jezebel, and he just went off and said, I'd rather die. 
Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. These prophets, and I could list many others, demonstrate to us that God is close to us when we suffer. When we're walking through the valley of the shadow, and we're not sure what's coming up next, God's promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will be with you even in the midst of your suffering. Verse 11 says, we count blessed those who persevere. In other words, as we suffer and still follow Jesus, God says that's blessed. That's blessed. Not that you have an easy life. Not that everything goes well with you and everything is just perfect. But when you're walking with Jesus, when things don't go right. When you're walking with Jesus when things are hard and difficult, and you say, you know what? I'm just going to trust Jesus. It doesn't make sense, but I'm going to trust him. Matthew 5 says that we see that the persecuted are blessed in the kingdom of heaven, and blessings are reserved for those who have endured hardship. Joy is more than happiness. It's not an emotion. It's a state of being in which we live daily in the trust that Jesus loves us, and that Jesus will see us through, and ultimately Jesus will come back and bring us together in the kingdom of God. Joy in the biblical sense is a deep-seated happiness rooted in the Lord, not solely in our circumstances. When we're blessed by God, like the prophets, we experience the joy of the Lord. And it connects us again with this already not yet kingdom of God. But the joy is in the knowledge that we aren't alone as we wait for the return of Jesus. We're reminded that we are people actively seeking the kingdom of God. We're looking for Jesus' return, but until he comes, we're going to be faithful to the task that was appointed us. I just thought of this morning, so I didn't think about the scripture reference. But there's a passage in Matthew that talks about the servant, the, the master goes off to the far country to do some business. And says, will he find us doing what he left us to do when he returns? Faithfully serving those that he's given, giving him food at the proper time. Will he find us at work when he comes? Or will we be over in the corner grumbling, complaining that the world's not the way it ought to be? God calls us to faithfully serve even in our suffering with our eyes fixed on Jesus. Like the faithful farmer we keep doing the work. We keep at the task. We're patient. We trust God. And we allow Him to keep us with joy, even in the midst of our suffering. I want to read a, a, a song here. We, we, we were working on trying to sing it. We're not quite able to get it this morning. Um, my voice still isn't back from when I was sick. But I want to read some of the lyrics to you this morning before we close. The song's entitled Trading My Sorrows. It says, I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. And I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. The verse goes on and says, I'm pressed but not crushed. Persecuted but not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. I'm blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure and his joy is going to be my strength. You know, those are good words. For it says that even though we may feel crushed, we're not abandoned. Even though we may feel pressed down, God is with us. And even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the scripture says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You see, in suffering, we can have joy, but we have to choose. We have to choose to look for the joy. We have to choose to look for the kingdom. We have to choose to look for the return of Christ. When we choose that, the joy will come. If we allow ourselves to slide into the side and get, become grumbling complainers about the culture, about our friends, about our spouses, about whatever, fill in the blank, then we lose our joy. But our joy comes from the Lord. Amen? Amen? Let's stand together this morning as we sing. And we're going to sing this morning the song we opened the service with. That is, we're going to sing the first verse of Joy to the Lord, because that's where our joy comes from. As we
we sing that today, maybe you're saying, you know what, I'm walking through struggle. It's been a tough week. I need to just ask Jesus to give me joy because I, it's, it's not there this morning. I just need to go back to Jesus and allow him to fill that in with his presence, with his love and his joy. So as we sing um, this first, actually we're going to sing the first and the second verse of this song. As we sing it, let's just sing joy to the Lord. And if you need to pray, these altars are open.